In this second film of the Microclot series, Dr. Asad Khan and I talk to professors Resia Pretorius and Doug Kell about their research into abnormal clotting in long COVID. We talk about the discovery itself, how you quantify the results of microscope analysis, and how long COVID patients compare to those suffering with ME-CFS and those who are suffering long COVID-like symptoms after the vaccine. We also cover what the hopes are for wider acceptance of the science and which other labs are doing research on this very topic at the moment. So let's dive in. So, professors, thank you very much both for joining us. Um, it's an absolute privilege to speak to you both. Um, I was wondering if you could, um, each of you, give us a quick potted history of what's brought you to this point in terms of the papers you've published, you know, on the recent microclot findings. Um, what, what, how has your career progressed to bring you to, to where you are now? The backstory is that uh, around about 2011, Risha and I were both working on iron metabolism, the metal iron, iron. And Risha published a paper in which she, she inadvertently failed to cite a review of mine with two and a half thousand references on the subject. So I dropped her a note to the effect that uh, uh, she might find it of interest. And uh, to cut a long story short, she took the bait and we started working together <laughs> Uh, uh, in the area of iron and blood, blood clotting initially. That then led on to the discovery uh, that the clots in a variety of chronic inflammatory diseases were amyloid in character. And then, of course, when it became obvious from the get-go that uh, acute and long COVID were both clotting diseases, uh, uh, we, we pivoted our research efforts to have a look at them and discovered, of course, especially in acute COVID, the uh, amyloid microclots that we discovered bacterial LPS uh, uh, were off the scale in the acute COVID. Clotting has been one of the, my focus areas. And when acute COVID came along, it was just the natural progression. And I worked with Jakub Lopsho, who is one of my clinical collaborators. He gave us, previously gave us samples from his clinic uh, on diabetes. So when, uh, when he started seeing the acute COVID patients in the, the, the ICUs, we had a chat and he said, well, I've got patients. Do you want to look at the clotting? I'm finding clotting. That's right in the beginning of 2020. And that's how our journey with acute COVID happened. And then long COVID actually just happened by accident because his patients didn't go on to having long COVID. But he started noting uh, patients that I referred to him that came to me saying, well, we've got these lingering symptoms. So that was just the progression of from clotting in other conditions, inflammatory conditions, to acute COVID and then long COVID just passed over our doorstep. On that topic of long COVID, uh, maybe for those who are unfamiliar with your work, could you describe what you saw when you looked at the blood of long COVID patients? Right in the beginning, I had an idea to, to compare the molecular blood pathology uh, biomarker content of the blood from patients with acute COVID and long COVID. And the way to do that, a typical research study would be to look at proteomics. So what proteomics is, it's a, it's a laboratory method, not really available for general pathology tests, but a research uh, method that can look at the protein content molecules of a specific protein mix, which in our case is blood. One of the methods that any proteomics lab would use is to first digest your sample. And one of the methods is a trypsin digestion. So that's quite a harsh enzyme and it's supposed, supposedly used to digest any protein. And to our surprise, we found that the acute COVID and the long COVID population, the sample did not digest. And then from there, we, we developed another digestion step. We could digest, and then we found all the entrapped molecules inside the long COVID population and the acute COVID population that we think might be the causative reason for all of the inflammatory reactions that we see within this, this population. Prior to that, we just used our bog standard microscopy laboratory method where we looked under the microscope at the blood of acute COVID patients and long COVID patients. And we found these huge microclots uh, that was in the blood of these two populations when we compare it to the samples of diabetes, which had less clots and controls even less. 
And just to say, even healthy individuals do have clotting, not so severe as you would find in acute and, and in long COVID, not at all. Very, very much a high load of clot in these two populations. So how do you draw the line between what's normal and what's not? Is there a sort of a, a level that you've established as being a kind of a break-off point? And are there any other conditions you're aware of that creates these sorts of proliferation of microclots? I mean, like MECFS, for example. I don't know what other conditions you've looked at in this way to be able to say, oh, we've seen this before. Or is this a completely new thing with long COVID? Well, over the years, we have looked at many, many inflammatory conditions, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, neuroinflammatory conditions like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. In all of these conditions, you one of the hallmarks of such an inflammatory condition, like all of the ones I, I mentioned, the hallmark is a, a, a abnormal or a clotting pathology. That is usually the case in all of these conditions, simply because of the inflammatory molecules associated with the disease. So various different uh, scenarios, different types of inflammatory molecules in all of the different conditions. Diabetes, obviously, most of people struggle with, with high uh, sugar levels. So for a specific condition, you will have a specific set of, of inflammatory molecules. In all of these conditions, there are higher levels of clotting. And when you compare the higher levels to that of a control, the control is much less. Um, obviously, microscopy is a difficult quantitative. Um, it's more qualitative. It's more difficult to quantify. But we have worked on a grading system. And uh, hopefully, we will soon be able to have a quantifiable uh, flow cytometry method for the microclots in particular. Clots that we see are not like the normal clots. Normally, blood clots on and off all the time, so that when you cut your finger, it starts clotting straight away, and you don't have to wait around. And so, when when you it's finished, the, the the clot is removed. And when you look at those normal clots under an electron microscope, they look like a plate of spaghetti, as you would see in the colour that really said to eat. Whereas when you look at the kind of clots that you see in these different conditions, they have an entirely different morphology. Which in the electron microscope. Like you parboil the spaghetti and it all stuck together. In those days, we called it dense matter deposits. And now we know is a so called amyloid kind of uh, configuration of the proteins. And uh, those configurations, A, are stainable by a stain called bioflavin T, which makes them look bright green and then not, they're not there. And B, are well known to be highly resistant to proteolysis. And uh, we also show that the spike protein induces these. So we know. Precisely, and the exact conformation, we don't know, is definitely different in these different diseases, but we absolutely know that in the case of COVID, uh, the spike protein is sufficient. You went on to do a similar study on the blood of MECFS patients. Um, how similar or different uh, were, were those findings? So for the microclots, the, definitely the MECFS patients have less microclots than you would find in a long COVID or in an acute COVID patient, much less. But they are the clots, the microclot formation comparable to someone with um, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, the level. However, what was for us quite an interesting finding was that the MECFS patients and the long COVID patients have significant platelet hyperactivation, uh, much more than in a, in, in a control and similar levels to what we have found in acute COVID and long COVID. So the similarities are on the platelets side and the microclots less than we would find in a long COVID patient that, that might be related to the spike protein. Nevertheless, the area taken up by the microclots in the MECFS study was 10 times that of the controls. It wasn't a small effect. Yeah, very interesting. So there's another group of patients as well who haven't had a lot of press. And these are the people who have developed long COVID-like symptoms, seemingly just from a vaccination as opposed to from COVID infection. I'm not sure if you've had a chance to look at any of their blood samples to see what's going on there either. We haven't looked at those patients in large numbers. We have looked at a few of them. So, however, the good news is that we have got a grant from the South African Medical Research Council to compare groups, the long COVID population with a group of patients that had the, vac the vaccine and now suffered from vaccine damage 
and we want to compare that with controls. So hopefully we'll soon have that data. Um, I know people like to say uh, it is long, it, they call it long COVID, but I think there is a clear distinction. It's long COVID from the, the, the actual acute infection versus vaccine damage after vaccination. And I think we need to tease out the exact differences and similarities between these two groups. I think it will mean a lot to the vaccine injured um, if the exact pathology can be determined because that group in particular faces a lot of disbelief and gaslighting, even above the usual level that long COVID sufferers do. I guess I'm asking on behalf of the audience now, uh, to both of you, where can people get tested for microclots? Probably not an easy question. Well, there's an easy answer, almost nowhere at the moment, but uh, we're hoping to fix that. So uh, I've just travelled to the US. I've just been there on a two-week uh, visit. I went to the Petrino lab at Mount Sinai. I went to uh, Professor Akiko Iwasaki's lab at Yale. And I uh, went to the Harvard lab, which is the lab of uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Yonke, who is a uh, pulmonologist, a uh, a pediatric pulmonologist, and I also she's also working with Dr. Mike van Elzacker and Poly Bio Research Foundation, Amy Prowell. So in all of those labs, there has been uh, this, the, the, the methodology has been set up. Uh, the, the microscopes are functioning. Thankfully, there are research labs in the UK that is already set up. Caroline Dalton is one of the researchers that have already done fabulous work at Sheffield Hallam. She has looked at, uh, at, at patients' blood samples and in, on controls, and she's also compared disease severity, obviously self-reported from the patients, with microplot load. But what's wonderful from her setup is she actually has an automated system. You know, hopefully her data will be out soon. There's also a group from Manchester uh, who works with a lot of clinicians as well in the team clots environment who have um, developed a plate reader system. And hopefully that data will also be published soon. So there are pockets of laboratories that have repeated and are working on it. Uh, the next step is obviously they must publish their research. And hopefully the next step following from that is more research institutions and pathology labs would be interested. Uh, the next step for us in South Africa was uh, with the help of USAD and UGES and uh, the wonderful long COVID community, Polybar Research Foundation, as well as Balvi and Kernels. We crowdfunded for a, a flow cytometer. It's in the lab. It has been installed. We're going to get training early in January. And hopefully we will be able to develop an automated system on flow cytometry, not based on the microscopy method that is difficult and, and, and perhaps not easily accessible. Hopefully we will have a method that people can use for microclot analysis as well as platelet analysis. And um, we hope to, to have that method widely available very soon. That's great news. Yeah, it's incredibly encouraging. Um, so c connected, I guess, to that topic is the fact that it feels like, especially in the UK, when patients go and speak to doctors, they're met with a, a degree of eye rolling, mm. perhaps, or eyebrow raising when the subject of microclots comes up. What's it going to take to get the medical establishment, the wider medical establishment, to take this more seriously? And why do you think they maybe haven't done so far? Well, the short answer is we don't know, um, but, but I think the longer answer is we need research laboratories like the Dalton um, lab, uh, like the Petrino lab, like Akiko's lab, to actually do it and to publish on it. Because I think the, the one thing that many people are worried about is just one, uh, one little research laboratory with some collaborators here and there in the UK uh, finding this information, uh, why uh, why give any attention to it? But I hope that our published research is now uh, given some hope to that, that many people have now realized that it's not just some little finding. Long COVID patients are really suffering from clotting pathology. And it's, it's, it's well known that they've got a higher uh, possibility to get strokes and uh, other type of clotting related pathologies. And I think people just need to, to, to do the research. Perhaps then, and we need clinical trials. That's, that's, that's what will turn their 
final head towards using the methods. Certainly the clinical trials, but in the short term, point of care doctors, GPs are just ridiculously stretched uh, because of the kleptocracy currently masquerading as a government. They don't know the first thing about these new methods, which would require them to go off label, which they're unwilling to do. And they don't have the techniques available to even send their people to go and have the measurements made. So, so in a sense, they're between a rock and a hard place at the moment. In the next film in the series, we pick up again with Reese here and Doug to talk about a compelling hypothesis for the mechanism behind post-exertional symptom exacerbation. Where they see microclossing existing within the massive jigsaw puzzle that is the causality of long COVID, and which are the dream drugs they'd like to see trialled to treat it. One final word, if you don't mind, because I'm so bad at doing this self-promotion side of things. If you didn't know, I'd written a book with Professor Danny Altman, then please do uh, Google the Long COVID Handbook and have a look. Uh, it's everything you wanted to know about Long COVID in one place. Also, there's some Amazon links in the description, which will take you to uh, be able to purchase hard copies, audiobooks and ebooks. Look after yourselves. Until next time.